Please turn with me to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. We're going to read a a passage that you may be familiar with, but remember, this is the Word of God, and there's always more. There's always more. And I think sometimes we don't see what's there because we think, oh, I know that passage, and we shut our mind to hear what the Spirit says. There's always more. So with that in mind, uh, let me just make one quick note Uh, A lot of your translations delete the second half of verse 3 and all of verse 4, and there's a reason for that, and we'll get to that in a sec, Uh, but I'm going to include it back in because I don't think the story makes any sense without that, okay? So let's start with verse 2. Now, there was near Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic was called Bethsaida or Bethesda which was covered with five covered colonnades, surrounded by five covered colonnades. And here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, and they were waiting for the stirring of the waters. From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters, and the first one into the pool, after such a disturbance, would be cured of whatever disease they had. Now there was one there who had been an invalid for 38 years, And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for such a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath, and so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath, the law forbids you from carrying your mat. And this, in in the Greek, this means, uh, the verb tense is such that this is going on all day long. So everywhere he's walking, people are saying to him, hey, it's the Sabbath, you can't carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat. And so they would ask him, well, who's this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? Now, isn't that interesting? He probably told him, look, I've been paralyzed for 40 years. I've been laying here. Some guy says to me, pick up the mat. I'm, I'm going to carry the mat. I'm not putting it down. They don't say, wow, who healed you? They say, who told you to carry the mat? They're so into the, into the law. That's their focus. Who told you to pick it up? But the man who had been healed had no idea who it was because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple. And he said to him, see, you're well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews, it was Jesus who made him well. So, Father, we just pray right now that you will open our hearts to hear your word and understand this. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, it's interesting. John doesn't tell us how old this guy was, but we can surmise from the passage that he was quite a bit older because Jesus says, you're well again. And actually, the word again isn't in the Greek, but it's implied, so it's a good translation. So that meant that he had been healthy for a time, became an invalid for nearly 40 years, and now he's healthy again. So if this illness came upon him, this paralysis when he was just 10, 12, that means he's in his 50s. If it came upon him when he was in his early 20s, that means he's in his 60s. Life expectancy at the time of Christ was just 35 years. And if you take out infant mortality, which was very common, it was 55 years on the outside. So this guy's an old guy, okay? This is a person who is not just paralyzed, but he has nothing to look forward to. He is broken in every way you can be broken. Whatever dreams or hopes or aspirations he might have had as a young person, you know, we all imagine what our life is going to be, that's all gone. That's shattered. At best, he wants to be out of pain and have some mobility because he's confined. There's nothing worse than confinement. And yet, in a matter of hours, really minutes, this guy goes from this ruined existence, this hopeless life, to one of healing, one of boldness, one of purpose, one of joy, and all because of this encounter with Jesus. And as I look at this, I see this, because John gives us this other information, he's not just telling us Jesus healed a paralyzed guy. He's giving us this information so we see that this man is not just healed, he's transformed. This is a complete transformation. And the way I look at this, I'm breaking this, going to break this down into seven very clear steps. And the transformation isn't complete till the guy gets to that seventh step. But before we break it down, and I'm going to use um, medical terminology to identify each of these seven steps so you can remember it. 
because the purpose of this is not for us to sit here and say, oh, isn't that nice, Jesus healed some paralyzed guy. No, John says at the end of this book, we could have filled the world with books about Jesus, but we've written enough for you to believe that he is the Christ, the, the, the Jewish Messiah, and the Son of God, and by believing that, you will have life. And that word, the Greek word there is zoe, like the woman's name, zoe. And that's a word that's used over 60 times in the Gospels, but it's used more in John's Gospel than any others. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. So, so God wants this man's transformation to be our transformation. But before we can break down these seven stages of this change in this man's life, I have to first set the stage because there is a direct correlation between this pool and all these sick people and this particular miracle. And so what is going on with all these sick people trying to win some kind of healing lottery? with this angel touching the water. And John doesn't equivocate this. He doesn't say, oh, well, this was a commonly held belief or this was a superstition. He states it as a statement of fact. And so to do that, I'm going to share something from my own life. Now, this is not my testimony, but it kind of skirts around it. But I have to be careful not to give my testimony or I'll go down that road. And we'll never get back. Um, <laughs> I grew up Catholic, and I meet a lot of people who say, oh, I grew up Catholic. But there are 1.2 billion Catholics in the world, and there are all kinds of Catholics. There's registered Catholics, there's nominal Catholics, there's convenient Catholics. And then there's that great, great big group that the pollsters identify as traditional Catholics. Um, and despite some doctrinal differences, that's usually where we find our brothers and sisters in Christ. They actually believe the Bible and, and the teachings. And, um, but we were not any of those kind of Catholics. We were hardline Catholics. My mother was what you would call a pre-Vatican II Catholic, and I won't explain what that means, but she went to Mass every single day of her life. And we went to Masses on every day, Sunday and every holy day of obligation, and we had priests in the house saying Mass in the living room. There were eight of us, six boys, two girls. We all went to eight years of Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, Catholic college. Um, we love to tell the story about the nun who was asking kids what they want to be when they grow up. And... Kids are given the usual answer. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a president. I want to be an astronaut. But this one girl, Celeste, she stood up and she said, when I grow up, I want to be a prostitute. And the nun was taken aback, didn't know what to say. So she went to the rectory to get a priest. She brought him back and she said, Celeste, you told the father what you told me. And she smiled at him and said, when I grow up, I want to be a prostitute. And the nun said, oh, thank goodness. Phew. I thought you said Protestant. We loved that joke because that was my mother. In fact, my mother, who had a great sense of humor, never laughed at that joke. She always said, makes sense. And uh, in fact, when my brother Jerry was the, came home from college, a born-again evangelical Christian, I'm not joking, my mother wept for three years. She went through like a shiva, like a, a, a mourning. I had a lot of Jewish friends, and it would have been the same thing if they had come to faith. Um, One of the things that was central to my mother's faith was her veneration of the Virgin Mary. And she was on her knees praying the rosary every day. I, I do not remember saying goodnight to my mom when she wasn't on her knees praying her rosary at the bed. I'd come home from school, she'd be in the den on her knees praying the rosary. There were statues of Mary and pictures of Mary all over the house. We had statues everywhere, you know, and pictures of every icons. It wasn't scary like, you know, uh, something out of Stephen King. It was, my mother was very elegant, the house was elegant. Um, but there was something in every room to remind you in case you forgot which religion we were. Um, and in fact, there was this picture of Jesus in the kitchen over the toaster that I really hated because he had this very disappointed expression on his face, very let down. And every time I saw him, it was like he was saying, you're eating toast again? <laughs> After all I've suffered for you? And uh, now, in addition to the rosary and the mass and the, and the retreats and the novenas, my mother loved to go on pilgrimages and... Uh, not to Israel. Well, they think they went to Israel once. Sometimes Rome. But her favorite place was to go, if the money allowed, to some place where the Virgin Mary had appeared. And there were all these various places around the world that she had talked about all the time. Fatima in Portugal and Guadalupe in Mexico and uh, Magigoria in the former Yugoslavia, which I know she went to that one. Um, but her favorite was Lourdes in the south of France, I think because it was very picturesque. Now, the story goes that there was this little peasant woman, girl named Bernadette, who in the 1850s had a series of visions of the Virgin Mary in kind of a, a cave or a, like a grotto. And in one of these visions, she told her there was a, 
a natural spring under the ground. If she would dig, she would find the water. And sure enough, she dug, and the water bubbled up. And then she told her in another vision, if people bathe in this water, they will be healed of whatever disease they have. So the girl went back and told everybody about this. Faced tremendous opposition. A lot of people said, no, that was a demonic vision. And, but people went out there and got healed. And so then word spread. More people came, hundreds, then thousands. Pretty soon the news reached Rome. They sent out some priests, you know, to investigate. So then finally they authenticated it. They built a huge church, a beautiful basilica. And tens of thousands became hundreds of thousands, became millions. To this day, no less than three million people a year go to this place. And so we went. My parents took the whole family there twice before I was 12. And this had a tremendous impression on me as a child. Here I was in a foreign country surrounded by thousands of sick people. And many of them were obviously very, very poor. And it was summer, it was hot, it smelled. And there were people with gnarled legs and crutches and people in wheelchairs and lots of people on stretchers, but they weren't carried on mats like this guy. They, they had these big wheels like rickshaws and the top half was covered with uh, like a canopy. To, uh, late, years later, I realized that was to shield them from the sun, but as a child, I thought it meant they were too hideous to look at, you know. But then there were lots of visible illnesses, you know, goiters and skin diseases and stuff. And it was, it was eerily quiet because they were so reverential. And they were always on the move. They were going to the cave, to the basilica, the, to the basilica, then to the cave, and then back again, and singing. Maybe they'd sing a quiet hymn to Mary or something. And um, it was just, it was overwhelming. And at one point, we were really hungry. And so my parents took us to a, like a little bistro or cafe that was off to the side. And uh, European restaurants aren't like American restaurants. You sit at big tables with, with strangers. And we were seated with these five elderly people who were very poor. And, uh, and this one lady, I'll never forget this as a little kid. You know, these things make such an impression on you. And she had took her teeth out of her mouth and washed them in her water glass. And I'd never seen that before. And we had a babysitter at the time who had a glass eye. And we were always coaxing her to take her glass eye out. So I, in my mind, I thought, maybe when you get older, all the parts of your body are interchangeable, you know. And... And they didn't have a menu. They just served one meal. And the meal that day was boiled rabbit. Well, we had pet rabbits, so there was no way we were going to eat this. And we said to my folks, you know, we've heard that some parents take their kids to Disneyland, you know. But, but I remember as a child, even as a child, thinking, if Jesus was here, walking through this crowd of sick people, he would heal all these people. He would go through the crowd almost like a superhero and zapping people, healing them, bzz, bzz, bzz. And everybody would be healed and go home and be happy. Now, fast forward years later. I'm on my own. I'm living on my own in Chicago. And I crack open the Bible for the first time for myself. Now, I have to tell you, my mother used to say, it's dangerous for lay people to read the Bible without a priest there to explain what it means. And, I, of course, as soon as I opened it, I knew why she had said that. But I don't want to give the wrong impression. My mother knew the Lord. Jesus was her best friend and she exemplified that in her life. And I'm blessed to have been her son. But she understood the gospel and read the scriptures through a filter. In her case, it was a Roman Catholic filter that she could not separate from the words. Know this. We all do this. We all have filters by which we're reading this word. I'll tell you one filter we all read. We're all Westerners. I love Western civilization. Western civilization has produced the most prosperity of anything. And it's under attack right now. It's not perfect, but I'll tell you one of the problems with Western civilization is it's materialistic, meaning it's a closed universe. I'm not materialistic like shopping, but it's a closed universe. This is why you see much more miraculous in the church in the global south than you do in the north because of that view that we have. That's one of the filters we have. Um, and there are many filters, which is why I think the translators use the excuse of, well, some of the manuscripts didn't have this line about the angel in the pool, so let's just take it out. I mean, that's very Western in, in the thinking. Okay. I, I am shocked when I read the Bible for myself. I'm shocked. First of all, I was shocked by how Jewish it was and, and affirming of Judaism. And Jesus said, one of the first things he says is, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. Like those old legends where the siblings are separated at, at childhood and they each have half of a locket. And then at the end of the story, they, they come together and they put the lockets together and it makes a complete picture. He, he's completing the picture, not, not throwing away the first one, but completing it. Paul says God's promise to Israel is irrevocable. His promise to the Jewish people is irrevocable. Now, you can't understand the book of Revelation if you don't understand God's, Israel's role in God's plan. 
So that shocked me. I was also shocked by things. Well, I was shocked that Jesus had brothers and sisters. I was shocked that the, there were no priests in the early church. Uh, I found out that was centuries later. Uh, the only mention of priesthood is the priesthood of all believers. I was shocked by the word saint. You know, we, we were taught saints were that, the special ops Christians, you know, the elite group that are so holy that when they die, you pray to them and they'll help you find your car keys. And, and it's like, no, this, the, this word saint means sanctified, means God has set us apart. We put our faith in Christ and he sanctified us. We're the saints. He addresses, Paul addresses the letters to the saints. We're, you and I are saints. It's amazing. That shocked me. Another thing that shocked me was how, how many harsh things Jesus said. Um, that I had a very uh, soft nursery view of, of Jesus, and, and I was taken aback by that. I think the harshest things in the Bible come from Jesus. But I was shocked also by this, and that's what I'm driving to. Jesus did not operate in the miraculous like a superhero. He, first of all, he had to receive the anointing from the Holy Spirit. He was already conceived of the Holy Spirit, but he had to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's a good proof text, by the way, that being born again and being baptized in the Holy Spirit are not the same thing. Jesus needed to be baptized. He needed to be anointed. The word Christ means anointed. He had to be empowered by God to do the ministry. And then he didn't, that, that miraculous power was contingent. It was contingent on the situation. It was contingent on the reception. This is why one third of the time Jesus says, your faith has healed you. They received it. This is why he stopped and said, who touched me? Who touched me? You did it. That's right. That's the way you, that's what you do. She, she grabbed his, the hem of his garment, said, I, if I just touch him. He said, he stopped it. He made a point of saying, that's right. Your faith has healed you. This is why it says the power of the Lord was present for him to heal. It doesn't mean that God was willy-nilly deciding, okay, I think I'll show up and heal. No, it means that the people were receiving. Remember when Paul was preaching and he looked down and he saw a guy and he said he could see that he had the faith to be healed. The faith was in the guy. And this is also why it says when he went to his hometown and they resisted him, he couldn't heal. It says he tried to do miracles and could not because of their lack of faith. And he was amazed. He's amazed not because we're eating too much toast. He's, he's amazed because he has so much more for us. And we resist it. We don't believe it. And then I got to John chapter 5 in my little reading as I was reading it chronologically. And I couldn't believe it. Here it was. The pool of water, the miraculous pool. All the sick people laying around, just like Lourdes. All these people. And there's Jesus walking through the crowd. And he doesn't heal any of them. He doesn't heal a single one. And I was, I was amazed. I was stunned. And I, 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 over the years, I've, I've sort of asked people about this. And I've read commentaries. And I've heard lots of sermons on this. And there's really, it kind of comes down to two schools of thought. Why didn't Jesus heal these people? They had faith. They were there because they'd heard about the angel. They believed, and they, they took the effort. Some of them had probably been there for years. So they have faith, and he has the anointing, right? I mean, this was his, he has the anointing, the power of God, but he also has the commission. He says in Luke, I have been, he opens up the, the, the book of Isaiah and says, the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the gospel and to heal the sick. So this is his commission. This is his job. And he has the willingness. Remember the man in Mark 1 who, who was covered in, in leprosy? And he says, if you're willing, you can heal me. And he says, I am willing. And he, it, I love it. It says in some of, the some of the early manuscripts, it says he was angry. He's not angry at the guy. He's angry at the disease. And he says, I am willing. And he touches him. And I'm sure they gasped. And he healed him. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is not a respecter of persons. And he does not show favoritism. So he has the willingness. He has the power. He has the anointing. He has the commission. He has the willingness. And he has the love and the compassion. Remember the people when he tried to get away, they were overwhelmed to the point where they couldn't eat, so they needed a break. And then they go on to take a rest and the people run around the sea and show up where they're, you know, uh, where they're going to try to take a rest. Is he mad? No. He has, he's filled with love and compassion for them. They're sheep without a shepherd. So he has all of that and yet he's walking through all these sick people. They have faith. They have the need. He has the love, the compassion, the willingness, the commission, the anointing, the power. But nobody gets healed. Just one guy one guy out on the periphery, I say periphery because he says I'm not near the water, and Jesus was able to slip out without anybody seeing him, he and his disciples. So I assume he was out on the edge. What's happening? What is this disconnect? 
Why is he not healing these people? And so as I say, I think I've come to see in the church, there's two explanations for this in the church, two sort of camps of schools of thought. And the first is, well, this is proof that it's not always God's will to heal. And sometimes God doesn't heal. The problem with that is, that means Jesus walked through that crowd of sick people and said, ah, nah, I'm not going to heal you. Ah, this guy, no, I'm not going to heal you. Not going to heal you. That's very much like the lottery here. The other school of thought is that, well, they had faith, but they didn't have faith in Jesus. And that's true. They didn't have faith in Jesus. He, when he said to people, your faith has healed you, it's because they had faith in him. They'd heard about him and they had faith. There's only one problem with that. The guy who he does heal doesn't know who he is. So he didn't know who Jesus was either. Now he encountered Jesus and he obeyed him, yes. So what is this disconnect? Why does he not heal these people in this situation? And I think there's actually a third answer to it, and that's what I'm going to drive at. Now, I'm going to very quickly go through these seven stages of this man's transformation. First, Jesus says to him, first he, he learns that he's in this position, he either, condition. He either learned that from someone pointing it out to him, which I doubt, because then they would have known who he was and they would have drawn more attention to him. I assume this is the Holy Spirit who showed him, said, pointed him out. But he walks up to him and he says, do you want to get well? Now, that's a very, very strange question. It's very easy to overlook. It's not, it's not like Jesus is seeing some elderly person trying to cross the road and saying, do you want to cross the road? And I think that's what the guy thought. I think he thought he meant, do you want help in the pool? Because the guy's saying, yeah, yeah, I got nobody to help me in the pool. Will you help me in the pool? But no, he has no intention of helping him in the pool. So that can't be what he means. So what's this question? Do you want to get well? It's a very odd question. I come from a long line of doctors. My grandfather was a surgeon. My brother's a doctor. My uncle's cousins. I have a lot of friends who are doctors. And one of the things I've learned to appreciate over the years is a good doctor is a good diagnostician. They know how to ask the right questions to get the right pieces of information to diagnose the problem. Jesus is the great physician. This question is a diagnostic question. He is diagnosing the problem with this man when he asks him this question, do you want to get well? There are, throughout the Gospels, these short, little, pithy questions that Jesus asks that are easy to overlook, but they're actually diagnostic questions. Why are you so afraid? Why are you bothering that woman? Why do you call me good? Or he said to Pilate, is that your own idea or does someone else tell you about me? That's diagnosing Pilate's condition. And this, this question, oh, I'll tell you one of the best ones is in Luke 7, when the woman, the sinful woman is washing his feet and the guy's thinking, he's not a prophet, he can't even see this woman. And he says to him, do you see this woman? That's a diagnostic question. He's diagnosing that Pharisee's heart condition. And I believe that's what he's doing here. He's saying, do you want to get well? There's a direct correlation between this question and this setting. Next thing that happens is the man says, I have no one to help me. Someone else always gets what I want. Someone else always gets in the pool. That, to me, is the symptom of spiritual paralysis. I have nobody. Someone else always gets what I want. It's, it's, it's both self-pity and depression and envy, always looking at what somebody else has. It is the seed of all bitterness. It's the seed that, that, that of the first murder where Cain killed his brother, envying his brother. It's the seed that brought Jesus to trial. Pilate recognized that the Pharisees had, had brought him in out of envy. I have nothing. Somebody else always gets what I want. That's the seed of this man's spiritual paralysis because Jesus, it's not a diagnostic question of his paralysis, physical paralysis. That's already established. No, he's trying to get to something deeper. And then Jesus says, get up, pick up your mat and walk. So the first stage of this transformation is the diagnosis. The second stage is the symptoms. I have nothing. I have no one. Somebody else always gets what I want. The third stage is the cure, which is first he says, get up. And I believe that's really repent. He's telling him to stop. Stop thinking this way. Get up. It's like, almost like he interrupts him, and there's a little bit of anger. anger. Not anger at the man, but anger at that, at that symptom. And then he says, pick up the mat. Now, that mat is going to be filthy. Okay, they don't have adult diapers. This guy's paralyzed. This thing's filthy. Normally, you'd say, leave that thing. You know, leave that behind. But no, he wants him to carry it. Now, obviously, he wants to carry it because it's the Sabbath, and he wants to draw attention to this miracle. That's the first and superficial, most obvious reason he says that. But I think there's something deeper there. Remember, this mat symbolizes this man's 
paralysis. It symbolizes the thing that has defeated him for most of his life. And he's saying, I want you to carry it, not it to carry you. And then he says, walk. And of course, that's the miracle that he can now walk. But it's also, we walk by faith. You know, a lot of people, when they start to understand faith principles, they sometimes think of them as tricks. Like, well, I tried that. I tried to speak to the mountain. It didn't work. These aren't tricks. This is a life lived. We walk by faith. Okay, what happens next? The people, the, the, the various Jewish leaders see him, and this, like I said, this goes on all day long as he's carrying the mat around. And they say, hey, you, the law forbids you from carrying the mat. Now, they're not talking about the Roman law. They're talking about the Mosaic law. They're saying the Bible forbids you. Now, here's a question. Is that true or not true? It's true. It's correct. But remember, Jesus came to complete the law, to fulfill. So they are technically correct. And it's, as I pointed out, it's so interesting that they don't focus on the miracle. They focus on the, the infraction of the law. I call this the side effects. So we have the diagnosis, we have the symptoms, we have the cure, now we have the side effects. And the side effects always come from our fellow believers. When we start to understand our authority in Christ and who we are and all that we have in Christ, the devil will use fellow believers to, to try to take it away from us. Always. What happens next? He says, uh-uh, I'm not putting it down. He submits to the Lord's word and he resists the devil. That's what it looks like. And then what does he do next? He goes to the temple. He doesn't go to the temple to meet with friends or to, you know, hear the latest gossip. He goes to the temple to sacrifice. He goes to the temple to thank the Lord and praise him for what he's done. I, I identify this fifth stage of this man's change as taking his medicine. He is taking his medicine. God said in, in uh, Proverbs, my word is medicine. It is health to your whole body. And that's what this man's doing. He's taking his medicine. Now Jesus finds him, okay? And he says to him, see, you're well again. That's a very strange thing again to say to him. But I think that you could draw a straight line between that line and the man saying, I have no one, and someone else always gets what I want. Because he's basically saying, you do have someone. And the Lord says to us, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So you must never give in to that thinking of, I have nothing. Someone else always gets what I want. It paralyzes us. And then we get to number six, the sixth stage of this man's transformation. And this is the trickiest one. This is the one where Bible scholars and preachers sort of aren't really sure what to do with this. He says, stop sinning or worse will happen to you. Now, one thing that's for sure Jesus does not mean is that this guy sinned and that caused his paralysis. I don't think that's uh, viable because just a few stories later, they see a guy who's born with uh, an illness in his case, blindness. And the disciples say, well, this guy was born with it, so he couldn't have sinned. It had to be his parents, right? And Jesus says, neither. This has happened so that the glory of God might be revealed in his life. But in saying that, he disavows of, of that idea that all uh, sickness is somehow the result of sin. So I don't think that that's viable here. So what does he mean? Stop sinning or worse will happen to you. I think that it goes back to what he was saying earlier. I have nothing. Someone else always... Guess what I want? He's saying to him, you can't go back to that way of thinking. If you go back to that way of thinking, you open the door for the devil to come right back in, and it'll be much worse. I also think he's telling him, you can't dwell, dwell on the past. You can't worry about the time lost. I'm sure the devil came to him and said, 38 years you've been paralyzed. Why didn't the Lord heal you earlier? 38 years you were robbed. You've, all this time was lost. Oh, and he could have easily have fallen back into it, worrying about all that he'd lost, looking over his life, oh, looking at the scrapbooks, oh, look at this, here, I was paralyzed here, I was paralyzed here. I mean, it, it would have been very easy. Paul says in Philippians, he says, not that I've achieved maturity, but this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. So part of that, stop sinning, is definitely do not go back to the past. Do not wallow back in the past. And then there's a third aspect to it, and it's this. And this is, this is really, it's not in the text, but I'm, I'm confident it's there. You've got to forgive. I am certain that this guy remembers all the people that he had asked, hey, can you help me into the pool? No. Hey, can you help me in the pool? No. And the devil would have come to him and said, remember that guy, he didn't, he didn't help you in the pool? Well, he's paralyzed. Why don't you go to his house and dance a jig on his front lawn and show him that you're healed? I mean, he, it would have been so easy for him to be bitter toward some of these people. But the Lord commands us to forgive. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you, Paul tells us. And Jesus said, if you don't forgive, then the Lord hands you over to the tormentors. 
In fact, he says, if, you're, if you don't forgive, your father can't forgive you. It, our unforgiveness of others blocks, blocks the work of God in our lives. It's one of the most important aspects of this. It's not in the text, but I think it's implied in there. And then finally, we have the seventh stage of this man's transformation, where he goes to the Pharisees and says, it was Jesus who made me well. Now, that seems mild enough, except referring to that other story about the blind man in John chapter 9. Remember, they bring the parent. They, they, this miracle is so amazing that they didn't even believe it. They said, ah, maybe he, wasn't, maybe he really wasn't blind. So they bring the parents in. Now, he's, he's told his parents. That's probably the first people he went to see was his parents. Told them all about Jesus. So they bring the parents in, and they say, now, is this your son? Was he born blind? And how, how is it that he can see now? And the parents say, yes, he's definitely our son. Yes, he's definitely born blind. Uh, as, far, as far as healing, you ask him. Now, they knew it was Jesus, but they didn't want to say anything. And John says they said this because they were afraid, because they, they knew they'd be thrown out of the synagogue. This guy doesn't care. He's bold. Paul says, I'm unashamed of the gospel. It's the power of salvation for everybody who believes. And so we see a boldness now. This is the full recovery of this man. So he, we have the diagnosis. Do you want to get well? I put before you life and death. Choose life. We have the symptoms of spiritual paralysis. I have nothing. I have no one. Somebody else always gets what I want. That always aborts uh, fruition in our life. Always. Then we have the, the cure. Get up. Repent of that way of thinking. Take your mat. Take the authority over the thing that's taking hold of you. You take authority and you walk by faith. Know that there will be side effects. People will try to rob, the devil will try to rob you through well-meaning believers, fellow believers. Doesn't matter. You resist them. You take the medicine of the Lord. You take the word of God and know the word of God and you stand on the word of God. And must not go back to the past. Don't go back to that old way of thinking. Don't worry about what was lost and forgive, the hardest thing of all, forgive. And then be bold in your witness. Okay, so now bring all this back to the disconnect. So what's the disconnect? Is it that Jesus said, nah, I don't want to heal these people? Is it because they just didn't have faith in Jesus? They didn't have enough faith? I mean, this guy had faith. I think the answer is this. These people as in the case of Lourdes when I was a child, are beggars. They're begging, God, please, God, please, 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 God, please, God. And what is the one characteristic of a beggar? Now, I'm not talking about crying out. As we all cry out to the Lord. We should cry out to the Lord. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. His ears are attentive to their cry. The Lord told us to persist, to persist until you get the answer. In fact, it's, it's worth looking at that for one second. I, don't, I feel led in this. Luke, Luke uh, 18, I think it is. Um, the parable of the persistent widow. This is very unusual because Luke, it's 18.1, I think. Um, if I'm right here. Yes. Okay, then Jesus told the disciples this parable that they should, to show them they should always pray and never give up. And then he tells the story about this widow that bugs the judge until finally he goes, all right, already, and he gives her the justice. And he says, if, if an unjust judge would do that for her, wouldn't God do that for you? But what's interesting is Luke editorializes before he tells the parable. Very unusual for the first three Gospels for them to editorialize. I think the Holy Spirit did that because it's an easy parable to misunderstand. We as Christians are not beggars. That parable is not about being beggars. It's very easy to misread that. And that's why Luke warns us ahead of time. This doesn't mean beg. This means persistence. He's, that's what he's talking about here. So what is the, the chief characteristic of the beggar? They don't know. They're in the dark, right? They don't know. Alms, alms for the poor, they don't know. They have the cup, the tin cup on the street corner, and they don't know if somebody's going to give them or not. They're in the dark. The guy at the bottom of the freeway ramp with the sign will work for food or God bless you or whatever. They, they're looking at each car window. Is this guy going to roll the window down? Am I going to get a dollar here? They don't know. They're in the dark. These people at the pool are in the dark. They're, they're, they're oh, maybe, maybe, maybe not, maybe, maybe not. The people at Lourdes, when I was there, it was all in the dark. It was all maybe, maybe. Did you hear? Maybe. We are not in the dark. The Lord has revealed his will to us. John says, if we pray anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we got it. So the answer to all of our needs, 
is to understand the will of God. And the will of God is the word of God. Paul says in Ephesians, we are seated now with Christ in the heavenly realms. Now we're going to be seated. I used to always read that and translate it in my mind, going to be seated. No, he says we're seated now. Christ sat down. We are his body. We represent him in this world. I'm going to speak politically for just a moment. You know, when, when Scott asked me to, to fill in, I was thinking, oh, maybe I should talk about what's going on in America because we're in a serious situation right now. And the Lord said, no, t- t- talk about this. And I said, okay. And, uh, but here's the thing. Uh, America needs the church. We're in a spiritual battle, and we have Christ in us. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. And our prayers and our speaking over this nation actually have a real effect. James said, Elijah was a man just like us, and yet he shut up the sky for three and a half years, and then when he prayed again, he opened up the sky again. But he says Elijah was a man just like us. And we're tempted to think Elijah wasn't a man just like us. But he was. In fact, there's lots of stories of things that Elijah gets scared and and good stuff that you go, well, I can relate to that. And yet he said one guy, one guy caused a a three-and-a-half-year famine, drought. And then opened it up, opened up the heavens again. And James is saying one guy did that. And he was just like you and I. A prayer of righteousness Availeth, the prayer of the righteous availeth much, James goes on to say. We have tremendous authority. We have tremendous authority. The nation needs us. Our country needs us. It needs us to be praying all the time and speaking over these forces of anarchy that are trying to destroy the country right now. You need to be speaking to them, not begging God. Speaking. We are not beggars. We're not in the dark. Okay, we have the word. When I was young and zealous, I, uh, I memorized seven books from the Bible. And I kept trying to memorize Ephesians. And I just couldn't do it. I, I just couldn't memorize Ephesians, and I don't know why. And so then I, I thought, okay, I'll give it a break, and I'll go to Colossians. And I, if you know anything, Ephesians and Colossians are called the twin epistles because they're essentially, he was written, wrote them at the same time, and he used them almost like an outline, so it's sort of the same letter. And I had the same problem. I couldn't do it. And the reason was, years later I was asking the Lord about this, and the reason was is because Ephesians is so great. We're so amazing in in who we are in Christ that I didn't understand it. So I couldn't memorize it. I couldn't get it into my head because I was so accustomed to begging. I was so accustomed to, oh, please, God, please, please, please. There's a reason. One of the reasons why God doesn't answer some of our prayers is because he's already answered them. This is why it never says in the Bible, Christ will heal you. He says, Christ has healed you. Take it out of the future and put it in the past. It's already done. It's a matter of my taking it. In fact, the word for receive, the Greek word for receive in the New Testament, is actually the same word for take. So receiving is actually taking. All right. I'm going to uh, speak a blessing over you from this passage. I'm going to speak the words of Jesus from this uh, story. So first things first, get up. (laughs) Take your mat. Take your authority of who you are in Christ. You are seated with Christ right now in the heavenly realms. The power that raised Christ from the dead. Jesus was literally dead. And at one point, no, no blood flowing no lungs, no oxygen in the lungs, no brain waves moving. He was physically dead. And the Spirit of God <sighs> moved into him, and he took that first breath. And he was now resurrected. He was greater than. He, the only reason that the angel moved the stone was not for Jesus to get out. It was for the disciples to be able to go in and see. He didn't walk through the walls where the disciples were hiding because he was less than the wall. It's because the wall was less than him now, which is why he said, give me something to eat to show them that. That power that raised Jesus from the dead, that put that first breath into him, is living inside of each and every one of us who have put our faith in Christ. Walk by faith. These are principles of life. It's, this, is a, this is a marathon. We're running this race until that moment when our, when our bodies are glorified. Know 
that there will be side effects. People will try to, the devil will try to use well-meaning believers to rob you of what is rightfully yours in Christ. But take your medicine. This is the medicine. It's health to your bones. Take your medicine. Submit to God does not mean you submit to the bad things all the time. This man did not submit to the bad thing. He submitted to what Jesus told him. And that was submitting to God and resisting the devil. And he walked by faith. And then he worshiped the Lord. I'm telling you, there's nothing, there's no, uh, at times in my life when I've struggled with serious depression, I have gotten out of that hole through thanksgiving. I start thanking God. God, thank you that I'm, I'm standing on two feet. Thank you that I have ten fingers. Thank you that I have two eyes. I can see. Thank you for my taste, but thank you for that. Thank you. And you, you can crawl out of a depression immediately by doing that. Thanksgiving is one of the greatest privileges we have. And worshiping, worshiping the Lord, taking our medicine. And don't go back. Don't go back to that way of thinking, I have nothing. Somebody else always gets what I want. Stop looking at how many followers you have on social media. You only need one person to be paying attention to you. You have an audience of one, and if he affirms you, you can scale a wall. You can do anything. And forgive. Forgive those who have hurt you. And stand up for Jesus in this culture, because this country needs us. It needs us. We need to be standing for what is right in our country right now praying all the time for our governors, our mayors, our president, our congressmen, our senators, and standing up for what is right in love.